Good morning, everyone. This is, I'm Pastor Dan from Rexmont EC Church. I just want to welcome you to our worship service this morning. Today we are continuing in our look at the letters of Paul to the Thessalonians. And uh, our message this morning is called The Great Joy of Ministry, found in Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 17, going up through chapter 3, verse 13. One of the things that I really love about Rexmont Church here is that we care for each other. If someone is going through a hard time, we rally around that person. We pray for them. We mourn with them. And probably most importantly, we encourage them. It brings to mind a story by one of the great theologians of the 20th century. <clears throat> Marcy says to Peppermint Patty, how many skating tests are there, sir? And uh, Peppermint Patty replies, eight, Marcy, and they keep getting harder and harder. Sometimes I think that the only thing that keeps me going is the encouraging words of my coach. Growl, snarl, snap, growl. Yeah, that's right. Snoopy, the, one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century. Actually, the uh, Jewish author, philosopher, and humanist Eli Weissel, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1986, made it his life's work to bear witness to the genocide committed by the Nazis during World War II. When he was young, his family was deported, first to Auschwitz concentration camp, where his mother and sister were sent to the gas chambers. Later on, he and his father were transferred to Buchenwald camp, where his father died of starvation and dysentery. He was 17 years old when the American army liberated the camp he was in. This man has seen a lot of hate in his life. And yet, when asked about love and hate, Eli Weissel observed, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. When we don't care about someone, we don't love that person. We hear it in the phrase, I couldn't care less. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago when uh, a lot of the kids would say, whatever. Uh, someone shares a problem and you shrug and say, oh, whatever, you don't care about that person or what he's going through. Years ago, I read a, a news article about a woman in New York City who got up and closed her window because the screams of someone being attacked in the street below was annoying to her. Someone was being murdered outside of her house and her response was, whatever. She only cared about herself. As Christians, we should be characterized by the phrase, I couldn't care more, not by I couldn't care less. We should truly care for one another and for all people. In the book of Thessalonians, we see the Apostle Paul's heart for these new converts in Thessalonica. He couldn't care more. He expressed his care for his new children in the faith in a very emotional language. He wanted them to know how deeply he felt about them and how painful his forced separation from them had been. Paul's example teaches us that if we want to impact people for eternity, we must care for them deeply. We have to have a good relationship with God's people. See, the joy in ministry is not dreaming dreams, building facilities, getting big screen TVs put up in front of the church or uh, putting in a new furnace with air conditioning. The joy in ministry is seeing God at work in people's lives, especially in people who you've invested your life. In his commentary in the book of Hebrews, William Barclay wrote, one of the highest of human duties is the duty of encouragement. It's easy to laugh at men's ideals. It's easy to pour cold water on their enthusiasm. It's easy to discourage others. The world is full of discouragers. We have a Christian duty to encourage one another. Many a time, a word of praise or thanks or appreciation or cheer has kept a man on his feet. Blessed is the man who speaks such a word. Because it's easy to, easy to be a discourager, many people are discouraged because of what people around them have said and done. Obviously, life and circumstances can also be very discouraging. 
I like the story of a former heavyweight boxer, James Tillis, who went by the moniker Quick. Tillis was a, a cowboy from Oklahoma who moved to Chicago for his professional career in the late 1970s and early 1980s. In fact, he was the first person who went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mike Tyson. Now, he lost, but he didn't get knocked out. And there weren't too many people that fought Mike Tyson and didn't get knocked out. Tillis remembers his first day in Chicago, the Windy City, after his arrival from Tulsa, Oklahoma. He said, I got off the bus with two cardboard suitcases under my arm in downtown Chicago. I stopped in front of the Sears Tower. I put my suitcases down and I looked up to the Sears Tower and I said to myself, I'm going to conquer Chicago. But when I looked down, my suitcases were gone. <laughs> what, a, what a discouraging way to start out our career. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 17 through 20, we see Paul's deep desire to be with these people who had become very dear to him, even in that short amount of time he was there. But due to reasons beyond his control, he, he couldn't come to, to see them. So he did the next best thing. He sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage them in their faith, even though it meant that Paul had to be left alone in Athens for a while. After Timothy returned to Paul with good news about the Thessalonians' faith and love, Paul rejoiced and wrote this letter to deal with some of the issues Timothy had reported to him. Paul did not want to leave the church in Thessalonica. He was torn away from them. Literally, it says, orphaned from them. And he thought, and though he made every effort to see them, Satan stopped him. That's what it says in verse 18. Our joy is found in seeing God's people prosper in their faith. Look what it says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 to 20. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. Our relationships are used by God to mature us and strengthen our faith. Paul sent Timothy for just this purpose in chapter 3, verse 2. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service, in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. It's discouraging to labor with love for people only to see your efforts prove to be useless. And Paul shows us his concern for the Thessalonians in chapter 3, verse 5, when he writes, For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labor might have been in vain. One concern that Timothy reported was that Paul's enemies in Thessalonica who had forced him to leave town were attacking his motives with these new converts. They were saying things like, oh, we understand how you got carried away by these smooth talking foreigners. They really seemed concerned about you and led you to believe that they had your best interest at heart. But their sudden departure and failure to return really shows they really don't care about you. They're probably relaxing down by the pool in some luxury hotel and chuckling about how easy it was to dupe you into following them. Now you're suffering and being publicly ridiculed because you believe those silly myths these people tried to convince you to believe. Why don't you just forget this Jesus thing and go back to leading a normal life? We also need to make sure we're encouraging each other in our faith. There's so many people around us in our lives that can that can also try to drag us away from the truth that we have found in Christ. I think another great joy of ministry is that God takes persecution and turns it to good. So how did Timothy's trip back to Thessalonica go? Well, let's look at Paul's assessment of it. Paul wrote, but Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He's told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you're standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Timothy safely traveled to Thessalonica and then returns to Paul with good news. Did you notice in verse 6 that Paul is thrilled by Timothy bringing 
good news. That word that's used there is often translated gospel. And it's interesting that this is one of the very few places in the New Testament that the word gospel, evangelon, is used for something other than the story of Jesus. We often say the good news of Jesus. But here, Paul uses that same word for the good news of the Thessalonians. And that should give us a, an idea of just how good that good news really is. Timothy's report included the fact that the faith and love of the Thessalonians was intact. He also reported that the Thessalonians had good feelings about Paul, and they longed to see him as much as he longed to see them. All of this was a, a great relief to Paul. Even in the midst of his distress and persecution, this news was an encouragement to Paul. I love that phrase in verse 8 where Paul says, For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. Now, we love to hear about people we've ministered to that are still living in the faith and on fire for the Lord. I spent 20 years ministering in Riff Valley Academy, and every once in a while I see on Facebook that one of the kids I ministered to is now back in Africa as a missionary themselves, spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And I love that. In everyday life, when parents receive news that their children are doing well, then they're thrilled. They can really live and breathe deeply. But when they receive news that their children are not doing well, they're devastated. And the same is true in the spiritual sense. Paul was so encouraged by the good news of the Thessalonians that he asked the question, how can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy you've given us? That's the kind of effect that faithfulness can have on people. Our faithfulness can bring encouragement and joy to others. A great joy of ministry is the power of prayer is evident. Paul finishes up this chapter with, with a prayer. Oftentimes, Paul either begins or ends his letters with prayer. But here, he's so thankful for the believers in Thessalonica and so thrilled at Timothy's report that he stops right here in the middle of his letter to go ahead and pray. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Paul's praying for them with a constant and fervent prayer. Paul prayed that God would clear the way for them to visit them. But, you know, there's no biblical record that he ever got back to Thessalonica. Sometimes God even answers Paul's prayers with no. Paul prayed for their love to increase and overflow for each other and everyone else. Love is such an important part of the Christian life. There's nothing more important that we can pray for each other than for our love to grow and overflow. Notice that this love needs to be for both Christians and for everyone else, including our enemies, those who persecute us. Paul prayed for their hearts to be strengthened and purified. He knows that things won't get easier for the Thessalonians, just like things won't get easier for us as Christians today. Strength of heart and purity are necessary to go through the persecution that awaits the church. And as always, everything in this letter looks forward to the coming of Jesus. Jesus is coming with all his holy ones, and we want to be found blameless and holy in his presence when he comes. That's something to pray about. So how do we then apply our lessons from Thessalonians today? How can we be an encouragement to others? Well, first, we can encourage by being present. <laughs> Our faithfulness and regularity and attendance when the church comes together is of great encouragement, especially considering the distance and obstacles some face. Hebrews 10.25 says it very well. It says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let's encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Obviously, there are going to be times when we can't make it to church. We go on vacation. We have to drop the kids off at college. We're not feeling well and don't want to pass on the sickness to others. 
But those things shouldn't stop us from meeting regularly. And after we've been on vacation and we, after we've dropped the kids off and after we're feeling better, we need to get back to church. A lack of attendance is discouraging for everyone. It's discouraging for those who come to worship and see so many that are missing. It's discouraging for the ones who didn't come to worship because they miss out on the spiritual blessings that come that that you get from being together with the body of Christ and receiving the spiritual empowerment that comes through worship together. God's people should long to be together. Paul experienced that longing when he was separated from the Thessalonians, and we ought to experience the same feeling about each other. Second, we can be an encouragement by being faithful through trials. No doubt going through trials can be discouraging for people, but the last thing we should think about is that my trials are discouraging to others. The opposite is the case. It's so encouraging when we see people being faithful in spite of the troubles. Being faithful through our trials doesn't mean we necessarily have to wear a happy face and pretend our trials don't hurt, don't discourage or don't burden us. But encouragement comes when we see others honestly express the struggles of their trials, while at the same time expressing their commitment to God or their trust in God in the midst of them. Whenever we face trials of disease, divorce, or death, that's not the time to stay away because we don't want to burden others with or discourage them. I can't tell you how many times I've been encouraged by the faithfulness of brothers and sisters as they have faced some of life's hardest trials. Third, we can be an encouragement by expressing our appreciation for others. The Apostle Paul was quick to express his love and thankfulness and thanksgiving for others. It means so much to me when I receive a word of appreciation or encouragement card. Uh, I keep quite a few of them. For many years after Abraham Lincoln had been shot and killed, his personal effects were kept private. But eventually people wanted to know what was in his pockets on that night. He died, and they finally published a list, and that list included several pairs of glasses, uh, surprisingly some Confederate money, and uh, not surprisingly, he, he also carried with him newspaper clippings about how the Civil War was going. But what was most interesting to me was that there were several newspaper articles that were complimentary pieces about Lincoln and his performance at president, as president, which likely bucked him up his, uh, and, and helped him in his often sagging spirits. If Abraham Lincoln needed an encouragement to help him stand firm, must be a good idea. I love the story of the uh, boy who says to his father, let's play darts. Dad, I'll throw the darts and you say, wonderful throw. Most of us aren't that upfront about our need for encouragement, and yet we all need it. Words of encouragement and appreciation are so powerful. This is something that all of us can learn to do. Look for ways to express appreciation for an effort or a job well done. Look for people who might be discouraged and send a note of encouragement. I guarantee you they will be encouraged, and so will you. Fourth, we can be encouraged an encouragement by spending time together. What more encouraging gift can we say than, I'd love to be with you? When we spend time with others, we're saying, I like having you around. I want to know you better. I want to share myself with you. That's one of the things I love about the men's breakfast that we just had yesterday. A group of men, there were six of us, and we just gathered and had breakfast together and said, we care about each other. Ultimately, it's an expression of how much we value each other. How can we spend time with others? Well, you can invite people to come to your house or to go out somewhere together. We can take a walk around a park or around the mall if you can find a mall that's open anymore. We, we can get together for lunch or maybe just a cup of coffee and go to a ball game or the movies or, or go fishing or something like that. The thing is, the activity isn't the most important part. The most important part is the notion that someone wants to be with you, and that's encouraging. Finally, we can be an encouragement by praying for others. Have you ever had someone tell you that they're praying for you? How did it make you feel? 
I really appreciate the way that we as church spend time during the service praying for specific people and their needs. You can see as I write down each prayer request, and I pray for each prayer request during the service. Sometimes I look at that list and go, whew, there's a lot of things to pray for today. Maybe it would be better if I just said, uh, Lord, pray for all of these requests, and, and don't bother going through each one. But I can tell you that will never happen as long as I'm the pastor. If you ask for prayer, we'll pray for you. And after each service, I take that prayer list from that day and put it in my desk drawer in my office. And each day during the next week that I come to church, and I mean, I don't come every day, but just about every day, I take it out and I pray again for each item on that list. I have every prayer request list from the first Sunday that I preached here last year to today. And sometimes to encourage myself, I pull out a random prayer list. Look it over just to see how good God is. We need to keep on praying, and we need to share with others that we are praying for them. Paul understood that when he talked to the Thessalonians. He understood the power of encouragement. He understood how much he was encouraged by the Thessalonians and how much he could encourage the Thessalonians himself. And today, as we get ready to leave this church service, my prayer is that we as a church can encourage each other and be encouraged by our presence, by our commitment to God, by just being together.